for those of you whom I haven't had a chance to meet, uh, I'm Perrin Beattie, I'm President and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. This year, as you probably all know, the theme for International Women's Day, which was on Monday, was women in leadership achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. And this is a topic that couldn't be more timely or important, and we couldn't have a more appropriate person to join us today. The Honourable Miriam Monsef is the Member of Parliament for Peterborough Kawartha, and you just, those of you who are on the line a little earlier, heard her singing the praises of her constituency, which is what a good constituency Member of Parliament does. Now, in addition to those responsibilities, she's Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development. So she really is the, the Renaissance woman covering a whole range of responsibilities. But it's, it's in those capacities as minister that she is joining us today. Now, for those of you who don't know her, she's a person of many firsts. The first women, woman to be elected in the federal riding of Peterborough Kawartha, the first Afghan Canadian member of parliament in Canada's history, and the first Muslim to serve as a federal cabinet minister. And she's been involved for a long time in community activities in her home community of Peterborough, she co-founded the Red Pashmina Campaign, which raised money to support education for women and girls in Afghanistan. Now, as Minister for Women and Gender Equality, she led Status Women Canada's transition from an agency to the new Department for Women and Gender Equality, and she secured precedent-setting investments in Canada's equality-seeking movement, including over $200 million to support Canada's first ever federal strategy to prevent and address, and address gender-based based violence. Now, Minister Monsef was also instrumental in launching an historic fund of $100 million, specifically to support the sustainability of the women's movement by investing in capacity building for women's organizations across Canada. Now, she's equally committed to, uh, to her role in advancing the, the cause of women and equality uh, and to bringing the voice of rural Canada to Cabinet, where she's working on important rural economic development priorities, including expanding access to broadband connectivity, an issue which is of major interest for rural Canadians and for many, uh, uh, many chambers right across the country. Minister, we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm grateful for the opportunity to connect, and I especially love seeing Keith uh, dancing on my screen right now. <laughs> She's great. Um, let's, let's turn to some of the questions. We're in the midst of a week of activities commemorating International Women's Day. Now, I understand that congratulations are in order for you for a successful Canada's Feminist Response and Recovery Summit earlier this week. Can I ask you to share some of your thoughts with us about International Women's Day this year? How has it differed from, from prior years? Well, Perrin, this year, and especially today on this somber anniversary, first, first anniversary of the pandemic, uh, we recognize that of all those who've been hard hit by COVID, and many are mourning many different kinds of loss, women have been hit hardest in terms of jobs lost, hours of employment lost, increases in unpaid care responsibilities, increases in gender-based violence for necessary reasons. The stay-at-home orders have left too many women stuck at home with the most dangerous person in their lives, often an intimate partner. Women are also the majority of those on the front lines of the fight against COVID in our long-term care homes, in our schools, in our healthcare settings. So in so many ways, uh, this is a really difficult year for women and for all Canadians by extension. At the same time though, Perrin, there has never been more women at the table than right now. We've got a woman finance minister. We've got, you know, public health experts, Teresa Tam, Supriya Sharma, Bonnie Henry, uh, Rosanna Palazzari, Salvatera in my own writing. Women are rising. And so our voices are shaping discussions. And the purpose of the Feminist Response and Recovery Summit was to let the feminist movement in Canada know that their voices will continue to shape our government's response to COVID and in building back better. And we were also able to just remind folks that despite all the ways we can't be together, 
women being stubborn and resourceful, were able to find a way to convene some 3,000 attendees at the summit, and I'm grateful to everybody who helped shape it. 3,000 participants. That must be something. The magic, the magic of internet. It is, it is amazing when you can, when you can do that, and it, it really sets the bar very high for next year as well. You, you were mentioning some of the challenges, particularly for women as, as a result of the, um, of the lockdowns in particular. Uh, we've seen impacts in other areas as well. Uh, so many of the small businesses in Canada uh, were started by women and run by women. And in the sectors that, the sectors that have been hardest hit, the hospitality sector, personal services, and so on, a disproportionate number of those businesses are run by women and they've been extremely hard hit. Um, how have you addressed this sort of an issue? Well, first of all, we are counting and tracking the impacts of COVID on those very sectors, parent, those women dominated sectors that you refer to. Uh, you know, we were able to provide immediate supports through the SERP, through wage subsidies, through, through CBA, separate loans and supports for women entrepreneurs as part of our women entrepreneur strategy, the first of its kind, by the way. But there is a recognition that, you know, these particular sectors, like I used to be a server for a very long time and, you know, I made decent money, but the the tourism sector, the hospitality sector, service sector, retail, they were changing rapidly before COVID. And what COVID has done is accelerate the pace of change and disruption in those sectors. So one of the things that my colleague, Minister Qualtro did was put together a one and a half billion dollar skills development fund that we then provided to provinces and territories specifically focused on those very women, those very sectors that had been hardest hit. And now we're saying, okay, if these jobs are going to be coming back later than others, and some not at all. How can we make sure that we still benefit from the talent and the resourcefulness and the energy of those women? And the immediate answer is skills training. So what if we address the shortage of early learning and childcare workers in our country right now at about 15,000 by offering some of those women who've lost their jobs in any of those hard hit sectors the opportunity to get skilled up and become early learning and child care workers. So that's one of the ways we're addressing it. And of course, Minister Freeland, the first woman in that role, is uh, focused on a universal early learning and child care system. So we address the jobs lost uh, and bring women back into the workforce. And she's recently announced a woman in the economy task force. And this group, along with many others, will inform our government's decisions moving forward. And as you know, Perrin, the upcoming budget will be historic and significant in many ways. And as the women's minister, you can be sure that, that I'm, I'm cheering on an intersectional gendered lens being applied to it because unless our women are safe and healthy and participate, participating in the workforce, Canada's economy will not go back to what it was and it certainly will not come back roaring. The Canadian Chamber certainly identified the fact that because women still carry by far the disproportionate share of responsibility for uh, child raising, that uh, one of the key elements of allowing a reopening of the economy will be to have available and affordable child care. Do you see that as being a priority in the budget? Absolutely, I do. And let me just say, 50 years ago, just a you know, a little bit down the street here, a report was tabled in the House of Commons. This was the Royal Commission on the Status of Women report before the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, before there were any shelters or, you know, before feminism was cool. And in that report, there were a series of recommendations. And one of the unfinished businesses of that report is early learning and child care. And I got to tell you, to have the chambers of commerce, to have business leaders, respected business leaders across the country say the same thing that feminists have been saying for decades, which is childcare is not just good social policy, it's good economic policy. That's given so many across the country it's some, some more fire in the belly to keep pushing this forward. So I wanna thank you, Perrin, your membership, and particularly uh, Sherry Boyce and Stu Harrison in Peterborough Kawartha for their leadership. When business leaders start to step up more and more, 
and support women, our economy gets stronger and we'll end up adding $150 billion to our economy. I think it's important to recognize that this is both the right thing to do, but it's also, it makes good economic sense. Uh, we, we're a rich country, but we're not so rich that we can afford to waste the talents of 51% of our population. And what we need to do, one, one of the deeply disturbing elements of the recession has been the fact that while we had such high job participation before by women in the labor force, so much of that has fallen off as a result of, uh, of COVID. And that has to be something that, that has a, it's a priority for us to repair. It, it's interesting that you cited the, uh, the Royal Commission on the Status of Women because I had gone back earlier this afternoon to refresh my own memory of that. That was two years, if you can believe it, before I was elected to Parliament the first time that uh, that report was released. But it was Prime Minister Pearson, I believe it was in 1967, was it, that, that, he, that he launched that? But anyway, it was Prime Minister Pearson. And uh, there is still unfinished business in Canada half a century later from that Royal Commission report. It speaks to the fact that it was, uh, that it was uh, groundbreaking work, but it also speaks to the slowness of society to, to catch up. How can we close that gap? Holy moly. Uh, yes, you, you were elected, sir, the same year, around the same time that the first woman's shelter in Canada opened. So that's also a nice way to remember your entry into the House of Commons. 50 years ago, if the cops were called because neighbors heard a domestic violence case, cops would show up, they'd find out that, that it's a case of intimate partner violence and they'd say, sorry, we can't do anything. This is a matter between man and wife. 50 years ago, a woman couldn't apply for a mortgage without her husband's signature. There was no minister for women and there definitely was not a GBA plus, a gender-based analysis plus applied to every budget. There was only one woman in cabinet, uh, Mr. Pearson, uh, actually said no to the Royal Commission twice. And it wasn't until two million feminists led by Laura Sabia of the Canadian Women University uh, folks, it wasn't until they threatened to march to Parliament Hill uh, in collaboration with Judy LaMarche, the only woman at that table, that he said, okay, we're gonna go ahead with it. So how can we close the gap we've made a lot of progress we we most definitely have women like me get to put their name on a ballot there's a hundred women in the house of commons now we're almost at gender balance in the senate 16 and a half percent of our businesses are majority owned by women or entirely owned by women we've got uh you know a gender balanced cabinet and the wage gap is now at 89 cents on the dollar and we're having conversations like this the private sector is asking for early learning and childcare. So we've made a lot of progress, but how can we do more? That report 50 years ago, as comprehensive as it was, did not mention gender-based violence, did not mention sexual violence. And one in two women in workplaces across the country experiences sexual harassment or sexual assault. That's something that employers and all of us can do one, more about. One in two. One in two one in two, and it was a number when it first came out around Me Too, when that hashtag was going viral, that really shook all of us. So that's one of the ways. If women don't feel safe in the workplace, if they are you know, constantly planning their exit, what if I'm stuck in the elevator with this guy whose advances I don't want? She's not gonna do well, she's not gonna go after the promotion, and she's gonna go elsewhere or give up on her dream. So that's one of the most fundamental ways. In in the more immediate, the vaccine rollout is going to be key. We've got four vaccines. Every Canadian who wants one is going to get one. And if we don't accelerate the, the, the pace of uptake on vaccines, then we'll have more women staying at home to care for those who are sick or care for those who have to stay home because more stay-at-home orders have been brought in. The woman entrepreneurship strategy, and I see some incredible women on my screen here, its purpose, and Mary Ng, our minister responsible, is, is running it, its purpose is to double the number of women entrepreneurs in Canada to, and to increase the opportunities for export development for those very same women. In addition to that, I think some of, you know, 
all, each of us women who have achieved anything, we've done so because others believed in us, because good men have supported us as well as great women. And so to the extent that mentorship opportunities are available, to the extent that championing women is, is an option, organizations that support women not only will do the right thing, as you said, Perrin, but they'll end up being, you know, more competitive and more attractive as places for talented women to go to. And then, of course, early learning and child care. A quality education not only helps parents, uh, reducing the cost increases their ability to spend more and, you know, have more a higher quality of life, but it also means that we're going to have a generation of super kids who've received really good child care and early learning training, and that's good for the economy as well. But sometimes, parent, it's just a matter of having conversations like this and reminding those who are in our circles but don't necessarily live and breathe this work that as a society we value and we respect women. And that in itself is transformative. You've talked about the impact of, uh, of the recession on women and how hard hit they've been. But there have been many other groups as well. Uh, if you look at the hospitality sector, so many of the people working there are new to Canada. And this may be their first job and they have lost it. So many people are young people and they've lost their, their first job. We talk a lot about having an inclusive recovery. How do we get to that point? Uh, how do we move to reopening, first of all, but how do we ensure that as we reopen, that the benefits are shared evenly as opposed to, to uh, the very uneven K-shaped recovery that we hear people talking about? Well, I think your last speaker from beautiful BC said it best, vaccines, vaccines. And yes, let's all sing that same tune because you know we've got plenty full supply now. And it's rolling uh, in my own province, uh, in my own community, over 600 volunteers have signed up to help administer the vaccine. So that's definitely step one. We're, we're also paying attention to the fact that if you're black, if you're indigenous, if you're racialized, if you're young, if you're living with a disability, if you're in a rural community, particularly older rural women, you've been hit hardest. And so first of all, we see you, we hear you, and we're developing programs and policies targeted to best support you. With my other hat, Perrin, high-speed internet isn't just about being able to FaceTime your loved ones, you know, if they may be in a long-term care home. It's about getting the opportunity to skill up from your home. It's about being able to, if you're a business on one of those main streets, like in my own community, being able to offer your services and products online. For so many, it's a matter of health and safety to be able to connect with a physician or a counselor. And, you know, for too many, uh, including along Highway 7, which is the road I traveled back and forth or did a lot of traveling back and forth to Ottawa and Peterborough, there are cell gaps. And those cell gaps are dangerous because they put too many women, and we've heard through missing and murdered Indigenous women, that, that that's a challenge. The skills training piece is key. Ensuring the vaccines are rolling out is essential. Providing early learning and childcare so that newcomer women and racialized women and all moms can have real choices about whether to go for that next promotion or to stay at home and care for their loved ones will be a big part of it. In the meantime, there's a recognition that, you know, nothing for us without us. So we're actively having conversations with young people who've been hardest hit and those BIPOC group you mentioned who've been hardest hit because they have the most at stake. And if we're not careful, they'll have the least voice at the table. The upcoming budget is, is going to be about the COVID response, as Christia Freeland has said, but it will also be about continuing to set the foundation that lifts up those who have fallen through the cracks and create the condition for their recovery and prosperity. So for women entrepreneurs, for those in those hard hit sectors, for black indigenous racialized folks, I, you know, there will be there will be uh, opportunities and means to address the barriers they're experiencing, uh, and I sincerely appreciate that the private sector and particularly the chambers are part of this conversation. I saw your your paper that you had released for Women's Day, and 
honestly, every time you send anything out about uh, what's good for women is for all of us, uh, it, it helps. And for all the small businesses who are part of your membership, we're going to have your back. We're not going to we're not going to suddenly stop with the supports because you are the ones employing those very same people and particularly for newcomers, helping them to build the right foundation for their life here in Canada and give back. So we've got your back, too. Now, we have a number of people who have questions they're going to be wanting to, to ask, but let me just so I'll have just a couple of more questions before we open it up to the floor. For those of you who uh, are watching online who'd like to put a question, uh, you received in your invitation information about how to put in a question using the Slido app. And so if you would please do that and submit that. You can also vote up the questions that are others may have asked that are of most interest to you. So please do that and we'll get to your questions very shortly. Um, Minister, I want to, want to deal with two other issues. The first is the report now, you mentioned some of the work that the Chamber had been doing, and uh, our Council of Women's Advocacy reissued five recommendations, which we had previously made to the government, uh, asking the government to support women through the, through the pandemic in the areas of child care and early learning, uh, female entrepreneurship and, and job pivots, among others. Um, can you comment on these recommendations and how the business community and the federal government can work together to support women? both as employers and as employees as the crisis continues. Well, firstly, thank you for that uh, very important paper and your ongoing advocacy. Keep that up. We've seen through the pandemic that some of those flexible work arrangements that seemed out of the question for so long are actually not only possible, but they end up benefiting many who have been hit hard by COVID. And, you know, I was talking to a single mom last night and she said, I hate to say this, but the, the cruel irony of this disease is that it's created, the, for me, the means and the opportunities to, to do what I've wanted to do for, for years and years. I can now look after my kids, my three kids. I can make them lunch, have lunch with them, do laundry, and do my work at the same time. So those flexible work arrangements matter. And parent, you know, beyond early learning and childcare, beyond flexible work arrangements and creating safer workplaces uh, around harassment and violence, I think the, the 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 private sector and small businesses, when you advocate, your voice matters. Your voice count and when you advocate for issues and causes that traditionally grassroots civil society organizations have been advocating for your voices amplify voices that have for too long been ignored so keep it up and i'll put an invitation on the table as well Perrin. there's a hundred million dollar feminist response and recovery fund that is available right now the call is open until march 24th if you want more information about it, you can find it on, on our website at women.gc.ca. We're looking, and this is, this is my department, we're looking for projects that are going to help over the next three years increase the participation of women in the workforce, improve their health and safety, and amplify their voices. And we've deliberately ensured that the eligibility criteria are as broad as possible so that folks can apply and be part of the solution who haven't previously. So take a look and if there's an opportunity for partnership there, we'd love to hear from you. Great. We have many local chambers of commerce online. They would be potentially eligible for a project? Unless you're a private entity, you are eligible. Excellent. And I, I see people making notes and we're getting ready to, to follow up on that. Um, just before we, we open it up to questions from, uh, from the audience, let's turn to the issue of uh, rural broadband, which you mentioned a little bit earlier. I used to drive that route that you mentioned uh, twice a week between Fergus and, uh, and Ottawa along Highway 7 through Peterborough there. I, this was initially at the time that cellular was first coming in. And uh, I remember the, the dark spots where the service would simply fall off. If, if there, it's hard to talk about anything good coming out of the pandemic, but if there is anything that's good, 
it is that we've left about a decade in terms of the digitalization of society and have moved ahead. Small businesses have gone online, a much, much higher percentage. And we've discovered ways of using digital technologies that melt geography, that mean that people in rural and remote areas are able to work remotely or to receive uh, medical services that would only have been available before for people in urban centers. Um, there's tremendous potential there. Um, you have the, the Universal Broadband Fund. Um, can you talk to us about, uh, about the details of the fund and how the government will work with service providers regarding the rollout to ensure that services are extended areas that don't have it today? So I'm giggling a little because as you ask me about the Universal Broadband Fund, my, my connection goes a little shoddy and I th think it's the, the universe reminding me every now and again how difficult life is in the best of times without high-speed internet or a solid internet connection and how particularly difficult it's been for too many Canadians across the country, including in my own writing, without that connection. The Universal Broadband Fund is the second phase of our government's investment in connecting every household to this essential service. We started with Connect to Innovate, the program in our first mandate, and that program by the end of 2020 was providing that connectivity to tens of thousands of households who wouldn't have it otherwise. That program also came with Canada's first connectivity strategy and Canada's first rural economic development strategy, which my predecessor, uh, the amazing Bernadette Jordan, put in place. What the Universal Broadband Fund does is accelerate the pace of connections that that first program and strategy put forward. So this is, at this time, the federal government, because of the Universal Broadband Fund, is the single largest government investor in high-speed internet. We've designed the program deliberately to be as flexible as possible. As you can see, there's a theme emerging here. We will connect backbone and last mile projects. We will connect cell gap. Uh, we will connect cell projects, particularly that benefit indigenous communities as part of our response to the calls for justice to MMIWG. The program also uh, was designed in very close collaboration with our rural caucus MPs who have, as you can appreciate, Perrin, that rural caucus is, is a feisty one and a very outspoken one. And for all the right reasons and what those colleagues reminded us of, Gail is laughing at me, what those colleagues uh, reminded me of um, was that, you know, even before COVID, 60% of smaller municipalities uh, had fewer than five staff. So it's not like they had dedicated grant writers who somehow magically have engineering and project management expertise. So in response to that capacity challenge, we put together a concierge service, um, a one-stop shop, a pathfinder service that communities can pick up the phone and talk to somebody who represents the government of Canada, who happens to be an engineer or project manager, and that individual helps them with everything from maps to connecting them with others in their region who want to get connected and help get them to a yes. Um, I'm going to ask my team to post the link to the concierge service in the chat box here because if there's anybody here who needs connectivity and who wants to reach out to us, please do. As we speak and every day in between question period and meetings, I have multiple dockets uh, that I'm going through very quickly to try and improve. Um, the Universal Broadband Fund has two streams. One for rapid response, and this was in direct response to COVID. Projects that are shovel ready this construction season can start this construction season and wrap up by the end of this year. Benefit from up to 90% cost share from the federal government. And then there's the core UBF, the core universal broadband fund, which is for projects that take two, three, four years. But this is significant chunk of money, which we work in collaboration with the Canada Infrastructure Bank to provide that fiber connectivity to as many households as possible. The idea here, and maybe I'll wrap with this, uh, the idea here is unless every household is connected, we're not gonna be as competitive as our uh, you know, other allies and other countries. And unless every household is connected, we are not prepared for the next crisis that our country faces. 
and we fully agree. We, we fully subscribe to that. Let, let's go to questions from, uh, from uh, the audience. Um, I would just remind people, if you want to put a question, please go to www.sli.do and enter meeting number W435. Um, and I think one of your staff is going to be putting up a, uh, a link for the Universal Broadband Fund. And Leah Nord has put up a link to the previous program you mentioned as well, if anybody wants to follow up on that. So let's go to, uh, to questions. The first one is, uh, you referred to the Federal Entrepreneurship Fund, which aims to double the number of women business owners. We also need to focus on current owners and helping them to stay open. Not sure that's a question. Um, it's an assertion. How would you respond to that? I agree a hundred percent. The it's not about just start supporting new entrepreneurs. It's about helping existing ones scale up what they've already got going, and that's in addition to the other supports we've put in place for small businesses, including during COVID. So I couldn't I couldn't agree more. In my own community, you know, you drive downtown Peterborough or downtown Lakefield. Um, I think it was about six months ago where it really hit me just how much we had lost these vibrant main streets, you know, where music would be playing in one and there would be concerts and gatherings. It was quiet and it was silence. Those small businesses aren't just creating jobs and wealth. They are part of the character and the identity of our communities. And what COVID has done is dim some of that light, but you can be sure that our government recognizes their value and we're going to continue to step up for you because you step up in so many ways for our communities. Thank you. Um, why is more not being done to help those parents who would like to stay home with their children but can't afford to, uh, e.g. income splitting, tax breaks, etc.? cetera? Uh, Heather says, I know several people in this position. Heather, I believe in choice and in real choice, right? If you choose to stay at home and look after your loved ones, that is noble and honorable and so very needed. The Canada Child Benefit is one of the most important ways that our government's doing just that. The child benefit before COVID, what it actually had done in providing money, directly to families into their bank accounts monthly, it, it cut child poverty rates by a half. That meant parents had fewer expenses to worry about and greater supports for all the costs that come with raising kids. But beyond that, during the pandemic, when schools closed particularly, we heard and we were on the phone with teachers uh, and other child advocates uh, and of course many moms. They told us, especially the ones with the lower means, they told us that their kids in school could usually count on one or two square meals a day, nutritious meals a day. With COVID, those costs went up. And so we increased funds through the Canada Child Benefit for those very parents, for those very same reasons. And we've got a bill in, in the House of Commons right now. Uh, we've got a bill in the House of Commons right now that we hope will be passed to provide additional support. So I think my internet connection went a little wonky here, uh, but maybe I'll pause, parents, so that you can tell me what you got and what got cut off. Um, most of that got through. It was at the front end of your question that there was a bit of a bit of a freeze there, but I think people heard most of it. Um, let's let's move to the next question. How can we make sure that women are not left behind in the recovery process? It seems that many of the solutions discussed are initiatives for the future. What can be done now? Oh my goodness. Um, we, in the six years, almost six years that we've been in government, uh, and I say this with a lot of humility, knowing there's more work to do, no government has done more than our government. Um, for example, frontline women's organizations organizations. We've increased funding to them fivefold. And these are organizations that all the research shows the best way to advance gender equality is by inv investing in those community-based supports that women turn to, not just for, you know, refuge and safety from violence, but these are organizations that provide 
immigration settlement. They provide skills training and leadership opportunities so that those women can go on to sit on boards and feel confident sitting at those tables, mostly around other men. The Women Entrepreneurship Fund is $5 billion. And this was something we passed in our first, uh, in our first uh, term in office. The work that we did with the gender-based violence strategy, the first of its kind in Canada with $200 million, that was in our first mandate. Pay equity legislation passed in our first mandate. Bill C-65, a bill to ensure that workplaces that are federally regulated are free from harassment and violence, that passed in our first mandate. And of course, you know, the, the representation of women, the valuing of women, the raising up of women, we haven't waited to do that. We started that on day one. And, you know, as Perrin said, in our first mandate, we helped create the conditions for members like yours to create over a million jobs in our first mandate. And in that first mandate, we had more women working, more young people working, more newcomers working, more persons with disabilities working than ever before. And on the lowest unemployment rates that we know of since we started gathering the data. So we're not starting from nothing. We're starting from a foundation from the very beginning that recognizes that when you invest women, when you invest in women, you support the family, you increase the vibrancy of the community, and you improve the economy for everybody. Now we're, we're rolling up our sleeves extra high and doubling down on those efforts and targeting our efforts further on those who need our support the most. Thank you. There was a brief freeze there, which, which simply confirms that you're not jumping the line in terms of access <laughs> to the Universal Broadband Fund. Uh, no, my friends, I hear you and I feel your pain. <laughs> um, let's go to the next question. Will the government consider removing tax barriers for child care by expanding the eligibility of small business owners who can claim child care expenses and making child care an eligible business deduction? So I saw that in the paper that you have released, uh, and I'm sure that Christia Freeland and Mona Fortier, who are in the bowels of the Department of Finance somewhere working on the budget, have definitely taken that into account. I'll tell you, my main priority for universal early learning and child care is that we actually build a system, and we don't inadvertently create the conditions that provide women more incentives to stay home when the real choice is, will I get that job opportunity that allows me to earn a higher income for my family or not? So that particular proposal, I think it was the, the fifth proposal that you had put, put in place, I thought it was a thoughtful one. And I know that the ministers responsible for the budget are looking at it very closely. But the budget should be coming soon, so stay tuned. Um, look, we're among friends. What's the date for the budget? Oh, well, let me just text you right away, Perrin. I, I don't know. It's coming very soon. And, and you know, it will be a historic budget. It, it'll definitely be one of the most significant in, in modern Canadian history. And I can promise you that a very comprehensive gender-based analysis plus will be applied to it. We will be watching for it. Um, next one is a comment. Last month, the Canadian Chamber held a roundtable on business re reconciliation. The importance not only of universal broadband was highlighted, uh, also needs there needs to be a focus on complete and wraparound services and then brackets housing. Um, not entirely sure what, what the interpretation of the question is. How are you doing with it? Well, on housing, we asked Canadians at the beginning of this pandemic to stay home, to work from home, to study from home. but not every home is a safe home and not everybody has a place to call home. So in my own community, housing is a challenge. And, you know, the the national housing strategy, the first of its kind, um, offers now over $70 billion for partnerships with developers, with nonprofits, with municipalities, with indigenous entities to help address homelessness and to ensure that everyone has a safe place to call home. And if, if your community has a housing need, I highly encourage you to look at the National Housing Strategy. The website is placetocallhome.ca. 
Uh, and every 60 days, there is a rolling intake period so that you don't have to wait every year to apply. It's an ongoing rolling intake. And the folks at CMHC, your regional advisor is the person you want to be best friends with, as well as your member of parliament. Uh, and they can help navigate the process for you and figure out which stream is most suitable for your needs. Uh, I'm, I'm in, you know, cottage country. And my partner and I, we, we were supposed to get married this past year, but okay, COVID, that wasn't in the books. So we thought, okay, let's, let's instead of spending a lot of money on a wedding, let's look for a place to call home of our own. The housing market in Peterborough is hot, as is the case everywhere. So housing has also suddenly not just become a, you know, a quality of life, uh, a, a public health preventative measure around a lot of the ills, including COVID, but housing is fundamental to our community's prosperity. And the more housing we build, the more money comes into our municipal government's coffers and the better our quality of life gets. So our government's firmly behind and ready to work with anybody who wants to increase the housing stock in our country. And of course, to maintain what exists so that we don't lose it. We can't afford to lose it. In my own community, housing seems to be the limiting factor to managing our growth. Uh, but thankfully, we have smart, thoughtful leaders with a vision to do something about that. Now, you wouldn't give us the date for the budget. Will you at least give us the date for the wedding? It's TBD. It's like so many others, like so many others. Uh, we also have funerals that we have to plan, and we have birthdays that we've missed, and graduation ceremonies that need to be redone. Those rites of passage are gone, but you can be sure that you'll know about it, and whether we like it or not, there will be a Zoom element to it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stay in suspense on both items for the next one. Uh, the next two questions are with regard to the Universal Broadband Fund. Uh, first one is, uh, in accessing UBF funding, many have come up against incorrect mapping data. What is the federal government planning to do to ensure that mapping errors are corrected and communities in need can access the program? That's a very important question. Thank you so much. Um, one of the first meetings I had when I got the job as the rural minister was uh, with our folks in Eorn, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, has supported this regional project. And back then we were still using the hexagon model for our maps. That model was one of the first things that, that is gone, uh, and our maps, we're continuously improving them. We're getting help from communities and our partners to make those improvements. The concierge service that I mentioned earlier is the place to go to if you have ways that you can help us improve the accuracy of those maps. Um, our goal is to get to a yes with as many projects as possible and avoid overbuild. So if you can help us get that connectivity and you can help us improve those maps, know that we're certainly working on it and we'd appreciate your help. Okay, also on broadband, uh, with the UBF, are the accompanying discussions within the federal government uh, about the digital literacy skills for individuals and e-commerce for business? And it trails off there. Um, Perhaps you could talk about, uh, to accompany the UBF, what are the uh, discussions taking place within the federal government about digital literacy skills for individuals and e-commerce for business? What would you do to complement the rollout of the physical service? I think that is such an important question. It's a, a, the, the literacy piece uh, is, is the, the other side of the coin of accessibility. Uh, and our government certainly focused on that. The skills training uh, fund that I mentioned earlier will certainly target uh, digital literacy. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've had uh, programs in place that help our kids learn how to code uh, so that our kids are getting trained up to take up these uh, very well-paying jobs in the tech sector. And I know that my colleague, Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne, who recently took over for Minister Baines, the amazing Minister Baines, um, is very much focused both on literacy and on affordability. Thank you. Um, what federal seed funding is available for innovative ideas that align with federal mandates, such as hydrogen power, wastewater, uh, energy efficiency, exports, and tech development? 
for emerging female entrepreneurs in rural areas. So you've got oh both my rural goodness. and female on that question. Okay, I love this question for so many ways because an inclusive recovery, if it's not a green recovery, will still leave Canada at a disadvantage. And in rural communities, uh, particularly, there are, you know, if one woman does really well as an entrepreneur, the impact of her gift and the impact of her success will be more greatly felt than in a larger urban center. So yes, there are funds available. Um, you know, if you're looking for climate uh, adaptation and if you're looking for uh, green recovery, uh, Minister Wilkinson's office will be happy to connect with you. If you're thinking about specific infrastructure investments, Minister McKenna's office will be the ones to reach out to deliberately for that. As a woman entrepreneur, you are so welcome to reach out to me or to the amazing Minister Mary Ng, who is the lead on the Woman Entrepreneur Fund. One of one of the things that I'd like to leave uh, leave uh, my colleagues with here today is, uh, as in in as in as much as we are so far apart from each other right now, we've never actually been more connected. Uh, the the government of Canada is doing its business from individuals homes and we can come into your homes through conversations like this my colleagues and i as per the prime minister's request have a very clear mandate to connect as much as we can with individuals so the government isn't this place far away in Ottawa. It is individuals who are, you know, a, a, a Zoom or a FaceTime or, or a call away. We invite you to reach out to us. And if you have ways in your community to convene a few others so that that minister can show up and speak with a few people about opportunities that are available, we welcome that too. Great. Thank you. Um, a World Health Organization report this week indicated that nearly one in three women globally experience violence. With the work from home phenomenon during the pandemic, how can, uh, what can employers do to support their employees who might be experiencing domestic issues? So you've addressed this previously in terms of uh, uh, violence in the workplace, but now that people are at home, what's the role of employers in terms of trying to address this? Well, the flip side, of the you know being safer from potential harassment at work is workplaces were one of those informal sources of supports for victims who you know that was their their safe place uh, they could leave that abuse and and be around caring colleagues and HR specialists um, so the Canadian Women's Foundation came up with a hand signal so if you're on a zoom or a call with your colleagues and somebody does this um, puts their thumb in the middle of their palm and closes it, that is the signal for help. That's someone saying to you, you know, either either call the police or I need help, check in on me. That signal for help uh, has been really important because more often than not, she can't call for help because he's at home 24 seven too now. So if you see that signal for help, you can call her up and ask her close ended questions like, are you okay? Do you need help? Do you want me to come over and check up on you in a socially distanced way? Of course, do you want me to call the police and just keep an eye on her regularly? She might say, I need help, and that would be the opportunity to reach out to a woman's organization in your riding, the YWCA or a sexual assault center. Um, you can also go on our website and see for yourself what's, ava what's available in terms of supports. One of the first things we did in the first 48 hours of COVID is we called our partners across the country and said, what should the Department for Women do? And they said, rates of violence will go up. Women are stuck at home. Make sure the last doors they knock on, gender-based violence organizations, sexual assault centers, et cetera, are safe and open. So we did something, and you, you talked about silver linings. We did something that we never thought uh, would be possible, which is in a matter of days, we were able to get millions, tens of millions of dollars directly into bank accounts of organizations. So those organizations, there's now close to 2,000 of them. 
uh, including in Quebec, who are open, who are safe, who are caring, kind professionals, and they're there to provide her and her kids with the support they need. If she needs to leave the house, um, my colleague, Minister Anand, as well as Minister Hussein, work with us to arrange partnerships with hotels. And so hotels have been a big part of uh, the safety systems we put in place for those very women, so there's help for them. Uh, in addition to that, I think what employers can do is continue to have this very courageous conversation. The prevalence of violence has gone up, pressure is high, uh, and the more you talk about it, the more you take the stigma away from a conversation that for far too long was swept under the rug and seen as a matter between man and wife. Now, I wasn't aware myself at all of the hand signal that you mentioned. It doesn't, it's not as widely known as, as one would have anticipated. Uh, have you have you used social media to promote it? Uh, is there are there ways in which we can amplify that? We have a newsletter that we send out to over six thousand people, um, and we would be glad to share the information. What sort of material do you have that uh, that the chamber network might want to share with employers and others? Oh my goodness, that would make a world of difference, Karen. Yes, the Canadian Women's Foundation has a all that information available on their website and they've got a toolkit if you will to, to help do just that we will follow up on that uh, and that certainly is a tangible way in which uh, employers and co-workers can make a difference so we'll be very pleased to do that um, what can we do to increase wages for women on the front lines and long-term care so they can get what they deserve for working in such challenging conditions You cut out, but I think you were asking me about wages for essential workers. Yes, in long-term care. Right. So our our government has added through the Safe Restart Agreement and then in a separate envelope about $3 billion to provinces and territories to top up wages for those essential workers, pandemic pay. Uh, and that's been a part of it. Uh, I think that Canadians, one of the one of the things that you can help us with is to continue to advocate for the value of the work these women do. Uh, in my own community, these women have gone into work even after a pandemic has been declared or an outbreak has been declared in in their institutions. Because if they don't do it, who else? So they're truly the true heroes of the pandemic, and they ought to be paid equitably and for all the ways they've been essential and cared for our loved ones the least we can do is pay them their worth um, next question jackie from bc we're currently hiring for many highly skilled positions and are struggling to find applicants how can we and other businesses who need workers tap into your skills development funds as well as women and other canadians who are seeking work the the one and a half billion dollars that I mentioned, uh, and by the way, everybody, as we speak, I'm also voting on an app. So this is, I guess, this is one of the few, very few good things that the pandemic has offered. So I just voted. Um, the one and a half billion dollar funds that, that I refer to, uh, the funds were provided to provinces and territories through direct transfers. So it's up to them to determine what to do with. Um, I think making sure that public health measures are followed and leading by example, you know, addressing the vaccine hesitancy that will come right now we're only hearing from folks who want to who want their vaccine yesterday but once we get through those folks and we will there will come uh, the needs to have conversations with your friends, colleagues, loved ones about why getting that vaccine is important. Um, the $100 million fund that I suggested uh, you consider looking into is another opportunity to consider exploring. Uh, and if, you know, I'm sure if you're on this call on a Thursday afternoon, you're going to be watching for that federal budget and the provincial and municipal budgets that come. So feel free to, to reach out to us if you see something that, that applies to you there. And Perrin, I'll just reiterate one more time that the, the government of Canada is here at your service and we've got your back. MPs like me, we, you know, for all the ways that it is a privilege to be at this table at a time like this to serve my country, 
I have lost the best part of the job, which is the connections and the gatherings with people who offer their insights and suggestions on a regular basis. You are our eyes and ears now. So if you want to convene a conversation like this in the near future to explore possibilities, to build back better, to lift up the women in your communities, to increase their workforce participation, to improve their health and safety, let's talk. We're in this together. And the more voices we hear from, the more inclusive and the more complete that recovery will be. Thank you. We're, time is fast escaping us. We have three more questions, Minister, here. Let me um, try to, to get to them right now. As part of the federal broadband initiative, is the government considering incentivizing fiber optic connectivity where feasible? Yes, fiber is ideal. It's future proof in that it can be scaled up. Um, so we're certainly uh, looking to connect as many households to fiber as possible. There are some places where that's not an option and satellites will be the solution there. And then there are places where, you know, the residents will have to wait years and years for a fiber connection. And so we'll go with, with uh, another option so that they can have that essential connection in these very difficult times. Um, so you certainly have wet people's appetite here. How can we at a community level learn more about the training and skilling that's available for women and for all Canadians? You can go on the Government of Canada's website. You can reach out to our individual offices, to your member of Parliament's office. Uh, and again, if, if you'd like to have a conversation, we can also convene virtually and go into details about what supports exist and how they can be best tailored to your needs. Great. We are down to the last question. The navigation piece is so important. Can you share the link for the one-stop shop that you referred to? Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my wonderful team and Alex is here for my team to share the Universal Broadband Fund a link which she already has. Look at you Alex. Um, and so that's available. Um, Alex is also very kindly going to post the link to the training uh, supports that that I mentioned on this call as well so that uh, you have fewer, a little less navigation to do on your own. Minister, thank you. In the space of one very short hour, we covered an enormous amount of, of territory. And uh, we are deeply grateful to you at a time when it's enormously busy for you. We know the number of demands on your time and the fact that you would take time out from your busy schedule to be with us. Uh, we also watched uh, a bit of history in action as you did a <laughs> voting remotely in House of Commons by app. I hope we didn't distract you and the government doesn't fall because you voted the wrong way on that. Yeah. No, I voted yay. I voted early. I even like verified my face. I don't know if you saw, but the the privilege has been mine, uh, Mr. Beatty, to, to be joined by tireless advocates and business leaders in, you know, in a matter of an hour. This is the best part of my job and I miss it very much. So I'd love to come back and continue the conversation, perhaps post budget to say, okay, this is what's on the table. How do we make the most of it for individual communities, for entrepreneurs, and for their families? Thank you. You can certainly see there's an enormous amount of interest, and, and uh, let's look at possibly doing that. Minister, thank you so much. Good luck in the, the work that you're doing on behalf of Canadians. And we are, again, most grateful to you both for being with us today and also for all of your work and your colleagues' work on, on behalf of Canada. Thank you so much. Be safe, everyone. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We'll look forward to getting together again soon.